Yes, I. So I know you know. Representing for the ballad and the dread podcast as usual. Yeah, they had a half the ballad. Sit it out this week, you know. But definitely, you know, the mission of a career and same way as I said, new season, same reasoning. And today, we have a special, special, special guest, a returning resident, you know. <laughs> the great Makanen Sankofa, the art of the rise of Rastafari. See? Well, I'm make sure I get it, make sure I get it in the right order. You know? The rise of Rastafari, redemption, resistance, and repatriation. That is the right order, right? The rise of Rastafari, resistance, redemption, and repatriation. Does it matter the order, the order, the order of it matter or, or, or it's just a transition regardless? Because I think I, I wanted to ask that, that too, you know. But a matter of fact, we'll soon get into the reasoning. But that's one book, and there's also another book called Life in Gambia, The Smiling Coast of Africa, which is the next powerful book, too. And I know there's a next one on the way, a revised version of The Rise of Rastafari. Correct? And is there a particular timeline for that one? So the, the, revised, the revised edition of The Rise of Rastafari, Resistance, Redemption, and Repatriation, has just been released. So it was literally um, released recently, about a week ago. And um, it's out available now for people to, to, to order copies on, on Amazon or directly via me. Yes, I. It's a powerful book to see me, you know, because I feel like people, people really need to know what is going on as it relates to the information of Rastafari, because there's so much misinformation of Rastafari. So first question I wanted to ask you is, why revise the original Rise of Rastafari book. What was the need for revising this book? Is is there a case of outdated information that you felt like people needed to get? So the reason why I decided to revise the book, I originally first produced the Rise of Rastafari in May 2019. And as I mentioned now, we're in 2022 and I've just revised the book, is that the original book was 100 pages and I received a lot of great reviews. Um, I think it's got 77 reviews on Amazon and I've had an amazing feedback from the book. But the, the reason why I felt that I needed an expanded one is um, the, the, one, the first one initially was 100 pages and I thought, you know, there's a lot in-depth information. I wanted to release the first one initially so that people could pick it up and read it within a couple of hours or a few hours. That is an easy read and, and people can pick it up and they can go through the whole book. But sometimes when, when the book is, say, five, 600 pages, not everyone someone might read a chapter or they don't go through a lot of the contents of the book so most people that have read my book have read it start to finish why i decided to do a revised information there's always um new information we're learning new things and what i thought with a book as well for example i thought i could still keep it a small size book for example the new book is 183 pages but i could still expand on my knowledge of rastafari and certain things that i thought was important to highlight in the in the new edition which are different from the um the original edition was you know what the uh, the relationship between marcus garvey and heidi heidi selassie um i mentioned the role of the, of the garvey movement and marcus garvey in the emergence of rastafari but i'll talk a little bit more about the relationship between Garvey and Selassie um, in, in this book. Other things that I talk about, the Hindu influence of, of Rastafari, right? that wasn't in the first book, but in the revised edition, I talk about um, how Hindu influenced it. Now, now that's very important because uh, Lennon Howe, the first Rasta, or he's, or he's known as the first Rasta. There were other Rastas that came before him, but he's known by most people as the first Rasta. Yeah. So in terms of Lennon Howe, even his name, Gonguru Mara, that's a Hindu name. He was very close to the Indians. And there's a lot of strong influence, whether it's through, you know, what the, the ganja or the drumming and, and on, on how and the early inception of Rastafari. So I thought that was very, very um, important to expand on that. There's a, a chapter in my book where I talk about um, Rastafari beyond the Bible, looking at Rasta from more of a, you know, a natural from a black conscious perspective as opposed to a biblical perspective. And in that chapter, though, um, I think in the last chapter of the book, I, I, co I, I covered Rastafari beyond the Bible, um, kind of more from without kind of mentioning why a lot of Rast a lot of Rastas do use the Bible. So what I try to do this one is get the balance. So I explain that you know this is why, and I, I use this is why some quotes, and this is why some Rastas are more biblical, and this is the other side why other Rastas aren't. So I provided a bit more of that balance. 
Um, and another thing that I mentioned as well in the book is I, there's, a, there's interviews um, with uh, Lena Howe's daughter, which was an interview that was done on a, on a, on a Galaxy radio station by, by um, Elder Harakuti and Dr. Abu Ratata. And I thought that was important um, because she talks about her first-hand experience of living on Pinnacle. Um, now, Pinnacle was, you know, established by Lena Percival Howell um, and, and the Howellites, what they were called before the Rusters. They lived in a community um, in Pinnacle and it was the most self-sufficient community in Jamaica at the time, which housed thousands of Rastafarians. I think it was very important to get someone's direct experience of living there. Another thing that I mentioned is the Coral Gardens Massacre. I mentioned it in my last book, but I talk now exactly i've got again a, someone um, a witness from the coral gardens incident who talks about uh, his actual experience and and various things in the group book i've got another um uh, another family member a son of leonard howell so i've included more it had a lot of resources and material the first copy but i've recorded i've put even even more information in there more links and um more interviews featured with people that have spoken about um that have spoken about Rastafari, that are close to Rastafari, that have either experienced something uh, themselves, or they're talking from you know a, a position of of, of knowing of knowledge of Rastafari. Yes, I, I and there I mentioned so speaking with the relatives or the offsprings of of Leonard Owell, what do they have to say about the the, the, the gang now? Because you, you realize that throughout the history of Rastafari, are a lot of people know about the role of Ayla Celestia, which is the, the nucleus. But many don't really know about the role of Le Leonard Owell, nor the Owellites. Many don't even know what the Owellites, who the Owellites are. So can you explain to the people who are the Owellites and give us some, some, some insight into what, what took place at Pinnacle, especially from the perspectives of, of Leonard Owell offsprings? Yes, yeah, so... The Howellites, many would say they're the, the original Rastafari. So before you have groups such as you know, 12 tribes or Baba Shanti, uh, you had the Howellites. Now, in, at the inception of Rastafari, when Rastafari emerged in the 1930s Jamaica, one of the prime leaders, what is known as the first Rasta, as I mentioned earlier, is called Leonard, Leonard Percival Howell. Yeah. And before they were even called, named, known as Rastafarites or Rastafarians, they were known as, as Howellites. Yeah. And how Leonard Howell, he had, had been to Panama, he'd been to America, but he was a man that was born in Jamaica. And in the 1930s, he was trying to liberate black people. So he was trying, following on from, you know, take the legacy of Marcus Garvey, because Howell and Garvey had a close relationship. And, and, and as we speak about this in, in the book, Howell was actually a member of Marcus Garvey's organization, the UNIA. And Leonard Percival Howell, um, he was trying to get black people to be independent. You're talking about Jamaica, really a colonial, uh, still during colonial years. And you know, a lot of people's concept of God or the image of God, you know, would have been white Christ and it would be worshiping, you know, King George. So he was really an anti-royalist and he was saying that, you know, black people shouldn't pay taxes to King George. And he was saying that, you know, the time has come for black people to be independent and we must start to, to look towards Africa. Um, kind of like what, following on from Marcus Garvey, Mugabe um, was saying that we should look towards Africa for our redemption. And he was, um, Howell was trying to say that, yes, as, as black people, you know, we should be, we should be proud of, of being black. We should have our own, martyrs we should you know look within ourselves and we should really build a nation and look towards going back to repatriate to africa a lot of, a lot of similarities in the thinking of howell and and garvey and pinnacle uh, was a prime example of, of nation building and one of the main pillars of rastafari right, is nation building and what pinnacle was it was uh, a community that was established in uh, in, in 1941 and pinnacle it was um, located in St. Catherine, Jamaica, and it housed thousands of Rastafarians. The exact number you count will differ depending on who you go to, but it, it, it housed thousands of Rastafarians. 
and they lived in a community and there was a lot of skilled people that worked in, in Pinnacle. And what they were really trying to do again was break away from the status quo, break away from the system because Rastafari is a very anti-systematic movement. So they were trying to break away from the system and, and do for self. So you had people that there that were you know, farmers, you had skilled craftsmen, um, you had people that did various different, um, different things that worked on Pinnacle. And they managed to um, bank their own money in Pinnacle. They would sell produce to the market. Um, something interesting that, um, that when I looked at that, when I looked at the interview, I listened to the interview um, that was done and with Lena Howell's daughter. She was saying that even you know the produce they would sell to the market that it was sold to the um, the, the, the government of, of of Jamaica, and it's like they, the the prisoners for the prisoners and they used to buy it, and then even they, the produce was sold and um, distributed internationally. So that's something that I found interesting. But as I talked, as as I sorry, I listened more to um, the interview with, with, with Howell that I mentioned in, in my book with Catherine Howell I'm talking about now, the daughter of Leonard Howell. Um, there was many different things that I thought that was um, interesting about that interview, such as um, she was mentioning that they used to have like certain days where people would all get their plots to farm on land. And it used to be certain days where everyone would go and help this person to farm. And it'll be like another day and everyone goes and help that person to farm. And it was really, really interesting. Some, and something she also mentioned as well in, in, in the book is good. For those who don't know the Howellites, now the Howellites, um, the original Rusters, they didn't have lots, yeah. And this is something that she mentioned and I put in the book is that how well dressed the Howellites used to be. She said that, particularly her dad, Lennon Howell, she said that her dad, her dad and even um, Blade Howell, one of her sons said that, uh, one of his sons said that, you know, he was, Leonard Howell was always dressed. This is a man that used to wear a, a, a three-piece suit. And he's, I think she said something along the lines of, you'll never see him without his, like, you know, his, his jacket or look dressed, dressed out going smart. And like the Howell likes, he said that they were always very well-dressed, looking smart. So that's something interesting because I think there's a lot of wrestlers that fight against, you know, the, the suit and tie and they, they go for more the scruffy or, or the unkept appearance. And she was like, she doesn't understand why, why it's like that way because Rustas, we should be our, our royal people and we should look royal, we should dress royal. And she was trying to say that, you know what, that, um, yeah, in, in, a, in, in, in what she was saying was that, um, in essence, to take it, it simple, that she doesn't always, I think it was, she was, it was trying to be like, she doesn't always understand why, you know, what Rustas sometimes look the way that they do because the original Rustas, they were very well kept, smart dressed. And, and that's just something that I found um, interesting as well. I just want to say Pinnacle was destroyed by the Jamaican government in, um, it was, there was, there was raids throughout 1941 to 1958. Um, 1955, they had a big raid in Pinnacle. And then 1958, I mean, the, 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 like, the, a lot of the occupants that were still there um, had to move and disperse to places like Bacawal and other parts because the government based, they, they raided Pinnacle. And that's basically what led to the, the, the big demise of, of, of Pinnacle. Well, let me hear you say mountain, mountain.